go back and sing together it's from there are beautiful trees there are beautiful trees within the island there are clear streams of water there are birds okay from the beginning breathing in feel safe. Could you repeat that last line? Breathing out, I feel safe. I enjoy going back to my island. Can we try the whole thing together? One more time. Sing it one more time. Maybe we with can the, with the violin now. Very nice. And so we can really get in touch with the beautiful island that is in each of us, that is full of freshness and beautiful trees and birds, our calm, our stability, our patience, our love. So we sing this song and we really can be in our island. <coughs> Breathe in, I go back to the island within we can try an, another song. It's not in our book. It's a, a song that we can um, use as a practice whenever we listen to a bell. So we'll be listening to the bell tonight. And the bell just helps us to come back to our breathing, to come back to our body, and to calm our mind. But once you leave here and you might not have a bell at home, Maybe you have a clock that chimes, or maybe when you hear the birds, or 
when you hear children laughing, or even when you hear someone honking the horn, that can be a bell of mindfulness that helps you to come back to your breathing, to just allow your body to release tension and to really be in the present moment. So the practice that we do when we listen to the bell is we breathe in, we say, listen, listen. And breathing out, we say, this wonderful sound brings me back to my true home. <clears throat> so it's a very simple, short song. And it's actually, the sentence is there on the right side of your booklet under listening to the bell. It says, listen, listen, this wonderful sound brings me back to my true home. And I think this tune was given to us by a member of the Irish Sangha. So we're happy to share it with you all. Listen, listen, this wonderful sound is bringing me back to my true home. You try that? Listen, listen, this wonderful sound is bringing me back to my true home. And then the next line is similar, but a little different. Listen, listen, this wonderful sound is bringing me back to my true home. Try that. Listen, listen, this wonderful sound is bringing me back to my true home. So you try the whole thing. Listen, listen, this wonderful sound is bringing me back to my true home. Listen, listen, this wonderful sound is bringing me back to my true home. Once more. Listen, listen, this wonderful sound is bringing me back to my true home. Listen, listen, this wonderful Wonderful sound is bringing me back to my true home. Thank you. Now we will enjoy a, a guided meditation. So good evening, dear friends. We would like to offer a, a short guided meditation uh, before the talk for this evening. So please find uh, a comfortable position. You can sit up straight in a way that the air can move in and out of your body easily and freely.
You can have your hands in your lap or on your knees and your feet firmly planted on the ground, on the floor. If you like, you can close your eyes. We will start with three sounds of the bell. You can enjoy the sound of the bell and allow yourself to settle into the chair and to allow you allow the air to move in and out of your body, in and out of your body freely. As we are breathing in, we can become aware of the air moving into our body. Become aware of the movement of air in our nostrils, in the back of our throat, and into our lungs. If you like, you can put your hand on your belly and become aware of the rising of your belly as the air moves into your body. And as the air moves out of your body, become aware of the air moving out. The falling of your belly, the air in the back of your throat and in your nostrils. A gentle coming and going of the air moving into and out of your body. with the gentle flow of the air into and out of our body, we can also become aware of our body. Becoming aware of our body. And as we're becoming aware of our body, 
we may become aware of some tension in our body. Maybe there is some tension behind our forehead. And when the air is moving out of our body, when we're breathing out, we can soften that tension. There may be tension in our shoulders. And on the out breath, we can let go of the tension. There may be some tension in our abdomen or around the solar plexus. And we can let go of the tension on the out breath. aware of our in-breath and out-breath, allowing our mind to calm, to find peace. Allowing our body to relax, to calm and to find peace. Calming our mind and relaxing our body, we become aware that we are alive. And we can offer life a gentle smile. Is that better? Okay. (laughs) 
On behalf of Mindfulness Ireland, I am very honoured to welcome you all here tonight and to introduce Thich Nhat Hanh, or Thai, meaning teacher in Vietnamese, the name we all know him by. As most of you will know, Thai is one of the foremost teachers of Buddhism and a renowned campaigner for global peace and justice. His special understanding of engaged Buddhism, the idea of applying understanding and compassion to all aspects of everyday living, has attracted people around the world. It is this very practical application of mindfulness which has touched and influenced my life and so many other people's lives, particularly in helping to slow down, strive less, and experience the simple joy of being alive. I am sure that these aspects of his teachings are what endear Thai to millions of people around the world. For many of us, this will be the first experience of hearing Thai teach. Indeed, most people here may think this is his first visit to Ireland. In fact, Thai was first here about 20 years ago. And some of us were very privileged to hear him speak at the mansion house. It was a small and a fleeting visit at the time. And I'm overjoyed that the second visit of Thai and the Plum Village monastics is happening on a much bigger and more public scale. There are 2,000 people here tonight and many more with us online. And there will be almost 800 at our four-day retreat in Killarney. This surely is an indication of the growing thirst and appetite that people have for experiencing the joy and ease of being that we can experience in practicing mindfulness. So, dear friends, on behalf of Mindfulness Ireland, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Thai. Thank you very much for your welcome. Dear friends, when you look at one person, you might have the impression that he or she does not have uh, the capacity to understand and to be compassionate. But in fact, uh, the seed of understanding and the seed of compassion is in him or in her. So far, no one has helped him or her to allow this uh, seed of compassion and understanding to grow and to uh, manifest. And you may be the person who can help him or her in such a way that uh, the seed of understanding and compassion in him or in her to manifest and to make him suffer less, to make her begin uh, um, uh, to enjoy uh, life. In the Buddhist tradition, we speak of consciousness in terms of seed. Seeds. There is a seed of understanding in us. There is a seed of love, compassion in us. And if you know how to water, to nourish the seed of understanding and love in us, they will grow every day. And we know very well that happiness, true happiness, is made of uh, understanding and compassion. A person who does not have uh, much compassion within himself or herself is a very lonely one. He or she cannot connect with other living beings. 
And that's why to have the energy of compassion in us, we can be a happy person. All of us know that uh, without uh, the capacity to understand and to love, a person cannot be happy. But not many of us know how to to generate understanding and love as energies. Many people think that happiness uh, is not possible without uh, wealth, fame, power, and sex. But we see that uh, there are those uh, who, are, who have plenty of these things, but, you con- but they continue to suffer deeply. So we should have a better view of happiness. We should have an, another notion of happiness. And to me, happiness would not be possible without the power of understanding and the power to love, to accept. And these energies can be generated by a spiritual practice. The life of a person always um, has uh, difficulties. In order to overcome difficulties in our daily life, we should have uh, a spiritual practice. We should have a a spiritual dimension in our life. In the life of a nation, that is the same. A nation may encounter may encounter a lot of uh, difficulty and crisis. And the nation should have a spiritual practice in order to overcome. I remember um, when the event of uh, 9-11 happened in the United States of America. I was there for a teaching tour. My book, um, Anger, was published five, five days before the event uh, took place in New York City. I was uh, scheduled to give a talk in Berkeley about uh, true happiness. But uh, after that, after the, the event, I had to change the topic. How to calm ourselves down. How to uh, not to be uh, carried away by your anger, your fear. A whole nation can be carried away by the emotion of fear and of uh, anger. That is what happened to the United States of America in the year of 2001 during the uh, 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 9-11, September 11th event. And uh, if uh, we allow fear and anger to take us over, we will not do the right thing in order to uh, improve the situation. We may do the wrong things that will create a lot of uh, unhappiness and death and sorrow. The war of Iraq uh, took place um, one hour, uh, one, one year a little bit more than one year after that. And millions of people died of violent death and uh, injuries. That is why not only the individual should have a spiritual practice, but uh, a, a nation also.
in in order to uh, generate the energy of uh, understanding and compassion we should learn how to to handle our suffering and to to listen to our own suffering and the suffering of the world there is suffering inside of us there is suffering in our nation and we do not want usually we do not want to go home to us in order to get in touch with the suffering inside to embrace our suffering in order to understand it to find the roots of our own suffering we have the tendency to run away from our own suffering and that is why we do not have a chance to understand it according to my practice it is by embracing suffering and understanding suffering that understanding arises and when you understand your suffering compassion begin to flow and compassion has the power to heal and to transform when you practice breathing in mindfully you may go home to yourself and get in touch with the suffering inside and the energy of mindfulness generated by the practice of mindful breathing and mindful walking help you to be strong enough in order to recognize to go home and recognize the suffering inside and to listen to it our suffering reflect and is a continuation of the suffering of our parents our ancestors and it is connected with the suffering of the world and that is why understanding our own suffering is very important we can understand the suffering of our parents our ancestors and our nation and that kind of understanding always bring about the energy of compassion that has the power to heal and to make us lighter we suffer less and with that kind of understanding and compassion we can begin to look at the other person in a different way because we have understood our own suffering now it is much easier for us to understand the suffering of that person that person may be our partner may be our husband our wife our son our daughter or our compatriots and when we look at him look at her and look at them with the eyes of compassion suddenly we don't have the the intention to punish anymore to blame anymore and we have the intention to do something to say something in order to help that person to suffer less yes. and with that kind of uh, understanding and willing to help we are able to use uh, the kind of practice called uh, deep listening and compassionate listening and loving speech in order to restore communication between us and the other person and the other group of people and rec reconciliation will be possible with that practice we have uh, offer many retreats of mindfulness uh, a little bit everywhere in the world and the miracle of uh, reconciliation always take place in our retreats the practice is to go home to ourselves and understand our own suffering so that we can understand the suffering of the other person and after a few days three or four we may like to apply the teaching and the practice of compassionate listening and loving speech in order to help restore communication with the other person and the recon reconciliation take place 
it takes only five or six days for that to be possible. During the time you practice in a retreat, you generate energy of mindfulness and, co- co- and peace and compassion. And the people around you also do the same. And together, we generate a very powerful collective energy of compassion, of uh, mindfulness that can help heal and transform everyone in the retreat. There are retreats that uh, have uh, 1,000 and more practitioners. And the energy of peace and compassion generated by the whole group can be very powerful. It can help everyone in the retreat to transform and to heal. The monastics here, they have been trained to, uh, to chant in such a way that they could uh, generate uh, mindfulness of compassion and compassion. There is uh, a person whose name is Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of uh, deep listening, the Bodhisattva of great compassion. And while chanting the name of Avalokita, we go home to ourselves and get in touch with the suffering inside, because the monastics, they do have their own suffering. And their suffering also have been, some of these suffering have been handed down by uh, uh, ancestors and parents. So to go home chanting and go home to ourselves and get in touch with the suffering, recognize it and embrace and listen to it is a very healing practice. And we can do that without fear because uh, the practice of mindful breathing, mindful chanting can generate the energy of mindfulness and peace that help us to be strong enough to go home without fear and touch the suffering inside and listen to it. And when they send the name for the second time, they reach out to the people around them and in the world. They get connected with the suffering of the world, of the nation. And again, the energy of uh, understanding and compassion is born from that kind of uh, getting in touch. So all of us are invited to uh, join the practice. We don't have to chant alone, but we can follow our in-breath and our breath and allow ourselves to be fully present in the here and the now, stopping our thinking. The easiest way to stop our thinking is to focus our attention on our in-breath and our out-breath. And when we breathe in, we are aware that there is a body, our own body. We connect with our body. And if there is uh, some tension in our body, we allow our body to release the tension simply to be in the here and the now and allow the energy of mindfulness and peace and compassion to penetrate into our body, in our mind, in our heart. And this is possible. If we know how to uh, stop the thinking, to focus your attention only on your in-breath and out-breath and allow our body to, uh, to be in the here and the now, relaxed, the collective energy of mindfulness and compassion may penetrate into our body and help release the tension and reduce the pain that we have in our body. And we feel better after a few minutes of practice. The collective energy of peace and compassion is very um, uh, healing and transformative. Of course, there is uh, always some uh, tension and pain in our body. We have allowed the tension to be accumulated uh, 
a little bit too much in our body. And the pain increases because of the tension. So it is possible to allow the body to relax, to be embraced by the collective energy of uh, compassion. And we feel better after a few, minute, few minute, minutes of uh, listening. And if uh, we have uh, some pain, a sorrow, or fear, or despair in our heart, we may like to open our heart so that this collective energy can penetrate and help embrace the pain, the sorrow, the fear, the despair in us. We behave like a drop of water in a river. Allow the whole river to embrace us and to transport us. And if we can open our heart and allow the collective energy of peace and, uh, and compassion to embrace our pain, our sorrow, we will feel better after a few minutes of uh, practice. This is a very, very effective And if we have someone at home who suffers, who cannot come tonight, we can very well send this energy to him or to her just by thinking of him or her or calling the name silently. We learn how to make good use of uh, the suffering. And first of all, we have to be with our suffering, to listen to it. And the practice will help generate the energy of uh, compassion and understanding.
Dear friends, the practice of uh, mindfulness uh, is very pleasant, and you don't have to suffer while you practice. Mindfulness is a kind of energy that we can generate with our practice. The energy that helps us to be aware of what is going on. In our body, in our feelings, in our mind, and around us. And uh, first, we may like to begin with the practice of uh, mindful breathing. We don't have to make an effort in order to breathe, because we breathe uh, all day long already. So the practice is to focus our attention on our in-breath when we breathe in, and to our out-breath when we breathe out. You are breathing in. You just continue to breathe in. The practice is to bring your attention to your in-breath. Allow your in-breath to flow naturally. And this is the first exercise uh, in my take up. Breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. It's so easy. We don't try to, to make our in-breath longer or deeper or anything. We just allow it to be itself. It's like the sunshine shining on a flower. The sunshine allows the flower to be a flower. And yet it, uh, it is there for the flower. It shines on the flower. And the flower can profit from the light. So when we focus our attention on our in-breath or our, on our out-breath, something happens. That we release uh, our worries and our fear concerning the future. We release our regret and our sorrow concerning the past. Because we are without in-breath, and it is uh, possible to enjoy your in-breath. To breathe in can be a pleasant thing to do, and to enjoy your in-breath is something everyone can do. When I breathe in, I don't make any effort. I just become aware of my in-breath, and I am with my in-breath all the way through. And if you are with your eat breath entirely, you drop your worries about the future, your fear about the future, your uncertainty about the future, and you drop your sorrow and your regret concerning the past. Breathing in mindfully set you free. And if you have freedom, uh, happiness becomes possible. The essential is that you don't need, you don't have to make any effort breathing in because you are already breathing in. You just become aware of your in-breath and you, you are with your in-breath. You are present for your in-breath. Dear my, in -breath, my dear in-breath, I know that you are taking place. I am with you and you can enjoy breathing in. Your in-breath may, may take only uh, three seconds, but it can produce miracles. And you can get some insight, some benefit from it. First of all, you are connected with your body, because uh, your breath is something that can bring you home if uh, you breathe mindfully. In our daily life, very often our body is there, but our mind is elsewhere. 
and we forget that you have a body. You may spend three hours or four with your computer, and you get lost in your work or your entertainment, and you forget that you have a body. <laughs> but when you uh, breathe in mindfully, you bring your mind home to your body, and you connect with your body. And your body is a wonder. <clears throat> Scientists have been trying to understand the body. And the body is a, a wonder of life. If uh, we live in such a way that we get alienated from our body, you get sick. That is why it's very important to go back again and again to your body and so that mind and body can be together. The fact is that if the mind is not with the body, you are not truly there in the here and the now. And life is available only in the here and the now. Your mind may be lost in the thinking about the future or regret about the past, or may be caught in your projects your fear, your uncertainty. And your mind is, with, is not with your body. And that is why you are not truly there in the here and the now in order to live your life. That is why breathing in mindfully is to bring your mind home to your body. And when mind and body are together, you are established in the here and the now. And you can get in touch with the wonders of life that are available in the here and the now. The first wonder of life that you get in touch is your body. It's wonderful to have a body. you are mindful of your in-breath, the more you are concentrated um, in your in-breath, the more you enjoy being in here and the now. And you might discover the fact that you are alive. Breathing in mindfully, I, I get the insight that I am alive. And to be alive is a miracle. To be alive is the greatest of all miracles. A dead person can no longer breathe in. As we are able to breathe in, we touch the reality, the fact that we are still alive. And we touch the miracle of being alive. And that can create joy. And when we breathe out, we can celebrate the fact that we are alive. That is why the exercise looks simple, easy, but the effect is great. It brings us freedom. It helps us to be in the here and the now so that we can touch the wonders of life. And many of these wonders are available in the here and the now, all of them. And they have the power to heal and to nourish. So the first uh, function of uh, mindful breathing is uh, to bring the mind home to you, to the body, and help you to be established in the here and the now. The second uh, function, the second effect is that you can begin in touch with the wonders of life that are available in the here and the now for your nourishment and healing. And then if you continue to practice like that, you will realize that there are so many conditions of happiness that are 
already available in the here and the now. More than enough for you to be happy in the here and the now. We usually think that uh, happiness is not possible now and here. That is a kind of belief. We believe that uh, we need a few more conditions in, in order to be truly happy. And these conditions we are going to get in the future. That is why we sacrifice the present moment for the sake of the future. And that cre creates uh, the habit of running. We are running all the time to the future. Even in our dream, we are looking for something. We are searching for something we believe we don't have. But according to this practice, when you go home to the here and the you now with mindfulness, you may recognize so many conditions of happiness that are already available, and you can be happy right now, right, right here. Suppose I practice uh, like this, breathing in, I am aware of my eyes. When I breathe in, I generate the energy of mindfulness. And with the energy of mindfulness, I recognize the existence, the presence of my eyes. Breathing out, I smile to my eyes. And during the time I breathe in and breathe out, I discover that I have uh, eyes still in good condition. And this is a condition of happiness. That those of us who do not have eyes in good condition anymore, we cannot see things. There is a, a paradise of forms and colors available in the here and the now. And we need only to open our eyes in order to enjoy the paradise in the here and the now. And that is why our eyes is a condition of happiness that we do have in the here and the now. Mindfulness can help us recognize that condition of happiness. But there are many more. Suppose we focus our mindfulness on our heart. Breathing in, I'm aware of my heart. Breathing out, I smile to my heart. And I get the insight that my heart still functions normally. This is good news. Because there are those of us who do not have a heart like that. And their deepest wish is to have a normal heart like us, like ours. And that is why touching our heart, we may we touch one another condition of happiness. And we become grateful to our heart because it still functions normally. It is like we embrace our heart tenderly with the energy of mindfulness. And we feel thankful. And we know what to do and what not to do in order to help our heart uh, continue to be like that. You may like to drop uh, um, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, and stay up too, too late in the night. That, that, are, that are not uh, very friendly towards our heart. And that is already the the meditation on love directed to our heart. There is a, a scripture on the practice of the contemplation of the body in the body. And according to that, you stay in a sitting position or lying position. You just breathe in and out and pass in review all parts of your body. When you come to your eyes, you, you smile to your eyes while breathing in and out. And you go down to your lungs, your kidney, your liver. And you pass in review all kinds, all kinds, 
all organs, all parts of your body. It takes about 15 minutes. It's like a sex scanning your body, not with the x-rays, but with the ray of mindfulness. You are in a relaxed position. You are using mindfulness of breathing in order to visit your body. And you allow every part of your body to relax. If you come to a part of the body that is aging, suppose um, your liver does not function very well. So while you come to the, your liver, you stay a little bit longer, breathing in, I'm, I'm aware of my liver. I know that my liver suffer. Breathing out, I embrace my liver with compassion. You stay longer. That help your liver to heal. Even if you are taking medication for your liver, that practice will help the healing take place, taking place more quickly. Your liver might have been calling you, sending you a message, SOS, SOS, it suffers. But you did not hear. You continue to drink, to eat in such a way that make uh, the situation worse. So when you come to your liver, breathing in and out mindfully, you recognize your liver and its uh, suffering. And that, uh, at that moment, uh, the, uh, the, the energy of mindfulness and compassion can help your liver suffer less. And you may make a decision to consume in such a way that will help your liver recover more quickly. There are many conditions of happiness inside of us and around us. And the practice of mindfulness of breathing and or walking can bring us home to the here and the now and help us to get in touch with these conditions of happiness. We may like to take a piece of paper and try to write down the condition of happiness that we already have. I'm sure that uh, if we have the time to do it, one page would not be enough, two pages not enough, three pages would not be enough. There are more, there are more than enough conditions of happiness that we have. When we go home to our body and get established in the here and the now, we might get in touch with uh, the wonders of life deeply, and we can get that, feel, that uh, feeling of fulfillment right in the here and the now. This practice is called the practice of mindful walking. When you may like to try mindful walking from the parking lot to your workplace, the practice is to enjoy every step. You, are, you arrive at every step. You arrive in the here and the now. It's like uh, your breath. With every breath, you arrive in the here and the now to touch the wonders of life. Walking is the same. You allow yourself to have enough time to enjoy every step from the parking lot to your office. And you walk like a free person. You drop all the worries and fear 
and projects. Just allow yourself to be in the here and the now and touching the wonders of life at every step. You walk like a Buddha. You walk, you walk like uh, Jesus Christ. Walking meditation is to arrive at the destination of life with every step. I have arrived. I am home already because my true home is in the here and the now where all the wonders of life are available. In our practice center, we have uh, helped create, uh, create many practice centers in America, Europe, Asia, and so on. We always uh, apply mindful working <coughs> every time we need to to go for, from one place to another place. No matter how short the distance is, we always apply the practice of uh, mindful walking. We want to arrive in the here and the now with every step. We learn to stop because uh, many of us have got the habit of running. We have run all our life and we continue to run even in our sleep. We don't know that uh, the kingdom of God or the pure land of Buddha is available in the here and the now. With every in-breath taken in mindfulness, with every step taken in mindfulness, we bring ourselves home to the here and the now where we can touch the wonders of life that belong to the kingdom of God, to the pure land of the Buddha. That flower that we see, if that flower does not belong to the kingdom, what do you think it should belong to? All the wonders of life that we get in touch with uh, in our daily life belong to the kingdom of God. And your body also belongs to the kingdom of God. To me, the kingdom of God is now or never. And in order to, you don't have to die in order to go to the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is available in the here and the now. You need to be very alive in, the, in order to step into the kingdom of God. And to be alive, that is a practice. When you breathe in, focus your attention on your in-breath. And in three seconds, you come home to the here and the now. Establish in the here and the now, and you touch the wonders of, of life that belong to the kingdom. In order to love someone, you have to be there for him or for her. You need to be in the here and the now. How can you love if you are not there? And uh, the best kind of gift that you can make to your beloved one is your presence. It's not something you can buy in the marketplace. I know a, uh, a, little, a, a young man of 11. He suffers because uh, his father is so so busy. His father is a very uh, rich businessman. He can afford to buy his son everything. But the son is not happy because his father is not available to him. He's so occupied with his uh, business. He's rarely home. And uh, even if he's home, he's not truly home. 
his mind is with his business. So the young man felt very lonely. That morning when the businessman asked him, my son, tomorrow will be your birthday, right? Do you need anything I will buy for you? And the son did not, the young man did not know what to, to say. He did not need anything. And finally he found the answer. He said, Daddy, what I need is you. When you love someone, you have to be there for him or for her. And how to be there, that is a practice. If you know the practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking, one in-breath or one step is enough to bring you home to the here and the now. And if you want to be fresh, to be uh, uh, calm, to be solid, you continue your practice for a few minutes. And that is the practice of mindfulness. Breathing in, I see myself as a flower in the garden of humanity. Breathing out, I feel fresh. And you recover your beauty and your freshness. Breathing in, I feel stable, solid like a mountain. There are practices like that that help us to, to, um, to restore our freshness, our uh, stability, our uh, peace, and to make our uh, presence something valuable to offer to him or to her as a gift. That freshness, that's the reliability, the stability, that uh, tranquility, peace in yourself. These things cannot be bought in the market. You have to, to generate by your practice. And it does not take a long time. If we know how to practice mindful walking, mindful breathing, we can restore our beauty, our freshness, our stability, our freedom, our calm. And then you go to your beloved one and look into his eyes and smile and pronounce a mantra, darling, you know, I'm here for you. What I offer you is my presence. If uh, if the father of uh, the young man knew the practice, he would do that. He would do uh, a few minutes of uh, mindful breathing, mindful walking, in order to to be himself, to be truly in the here and now. And then he will look into the eyes of his uh, son and say, "My son, darling, I'm here for you." That's what uh, the young man needs. In order to love, you have to be there. That is, a, that is a, the truth. To be there is to be there for us first. In order to be for him, to be there for him or for her, you have to be there for yourself first. Because uh, the love for someone is always based on the love of uh, ourselves. If we are not capable of loving ourselves and of taking care of ourselves, we cannot love and take care of another person. This is my experience. So breathing in, or making a step, we go home to ourselves and release the tension in our body and reduce the pain in our body 
b r i t h i n in order to restore the freshness, in order to uh, restore our uh, our peace, our calm is very important for us. We suffer less with the practice, and we do not we do not have to put aside some time in order to do that because we can do that during the day. Suppose uh, um, you drive your car, and you can practice uh, mindful breathing, mindful driving your car, establishing the here and the now instead of thinking of the past, thinking of the future, worrying, allowing the anger, the fear, the worry to to carry you away. You can drive your car smiling and observing your in breath and out breath, and touching the wonders of life in you and around you. When you wash the dishes in the kitchen, mindfulness practice can help uh, the dishwashing uh, something into something pleasant. It's possible to have joy and happiness during the time you do the dishes. I have written a book on how to do it. <laughs> mindfulness, uh, the miracle of mindfulness. My first offering of the practice uh, in the West is that little book called the miracle of mindfulness. It was published uh, first by uh, a small. Uh, Publishing house in New York, and it was published also by Pax Christie in uh, in England. When you prepare breakfast for your family, you might like to practice mindfulness. You might enjoy every moment of breakfast preparation instead of allowing you uh, yourself to be. Caught by the worries, the sorrow, the uncertainty, uh, you focus your attention on your in breath and out breath. Feel that you are alive. That there is uh, uh, everything uh, for you, ready for you to make breakfast. There are those in the world who do not have uh, the facilities. In order to make their breakfast, there are those who do not have breakfast. They don't have anything to eat in the morning, and they are not sure that at noon they have something to eat. And you have uh, hot water, cold water, uh, oven, everything, and that is why <coughs> mindfulness helps you to recognize that you are very lucky. Even if you just lost your job, you are much more fortunate than many, many of us in the world. We in Plum Village, we have, we are a few hundred people living together in community, and no one of us has a salary. No one of us has a, a separate bank account. No one of us has an individual car. Or computer, and yet happiness is possible. And we don't we don't risk losing our job because we do not have a job at all, any job. <laughs> so if we suffer, it's because of our worries, our fear. If you are free from our sorrow, our fear, happiness is still possible, even if we don't have uh, um, uh, a job. Uh, we have to, we, if we don't have that kind of salary that we expect.
the Buddha spoke about uh, a person struck by the second arrow. And this can be very helpful. Suppose one person is uh, struck by one arrow. There is pain in his flesh. But if a second arrow comes and strikes exactly the same spot, and then the pain will be multiplied by ten times or even more. So the advice is that we should not allow the second arrow to come and hit us. When you have uh, some problem, some pain in your body, just recognize the pain that it is. Do not exaggerate. Do not worry too much. Do not panic. If needed, you ask a doctor to help you to to want to see the pain at its ease without uh, a lot of worries and fear and anger. Because uh, if you allow the fear, the anger, the despair to establish themselves, well, the suffering will be multiplied by more than ten times. That is the second arrow. So our situation is not too bad, may not too bad at all. But because we worry too much, we allow the past to invade us, we allow, we allow the sorrow and the, and the, <coughs> and the regret of the past to, to overwhelm us. We allow the uncertainty, the fear, the despair to allow us, and our suffering become enormous. We cannot bear it. And if we allowed ourselves not to be struck by the second arrow, if we can remove fear, anger, uh, despair, wrong perceptions, we will see that we still have a lot of uh, condition to be happy right here and right now. When we practice walking meditation, every step can help us touch the wonders of life that are available in the here and the now. We are aware that Mother Earth is there. Mother Earth is uh, the mother of all of us. She has given birth to many species, many Buddhas, many Bodhisattvas, many saints. The Buddha Shakyamuni is a child of the earth. Jesus Christ is also a child of Mother Earth. Son of God and Son of Man. And getting in touch with uh, these wonders of life, uh, enjoying the kingdom of God in the here and the now, happiness and peace become possible at any time of the day. Mindfulness is a source of happiness. Mindfulness helps us to touch the, un- the seed of understanding and compassion in us to help them grow and increase uh, and um, improve the quality of our life, our happiness. I remember one time I was uh, interviewed by someone who came from uh, the San Francisco Chronicle. I was in a, in a temple uh, on the top of a mountain Northern California. He came all the way through to interview me about the practice of mindfulness. I was sitting uh, under three uh, pine trees, very beautiful uh, 
trees. And uh, he arrived, and I said, Dear friend, let us enjoy some tea together, some tea together before you interview, or get your interview. Just sit here, it's so beautiful, and I will um, prepare some tea for you. And I arranged it so that we can, we can take our tea mindfully, enjoy every moment of drinking tea, and getting in touch with uh, the beautiful setting of the temple. And because he was not, uh, had, he did not have the impression that he is uh, doing an interview, that is why he was entirely with it. <laughs> and after that, the interview uh, began, and so easy, and he enjoyed the interview because he had, uh, he had been initiated to the practice of mindfulness without knowing that, how to enjoy uh, your cup of tea, how to enjoy sitting uh, uh, among many beautiful uh, uh, trees. And when uh, he finished the interview, I accompanied him to his car. I advise him, I offer him the practice of mindful walking to the car <laughs> so that uh, he can enjoy every step. I thought that uh, he was trying to interview me with, uh, uh, about the topic of uh, mindfulness practice. So these things uh, should be possible, <laughs> because mindfulness is not ideas. Mindfulness practice is not ideas. This is an art of uh, living. They can bring you joy, happiness, transformation, and healing. So halfway to the parking lot, I stopped and invited him to look at the sky. Breathing in mindfully, you acknowledge that the sky is there and so beautiful, so blue. But now you smile at the blue sky. And he admitted that it was the first time he looked at the sky that way, a miracle. And that is why the article he, he wrote after that is a very good one. <laughs> because he had some experience of the practice. There is, uh, there is a novel written by um, Anbea Camus, a French novelist, with the title L'étranger, not stranger, in which he depicted a, a person called, whose name is Merso. Merso has committed a crime, and, and uh, they condemn him, and he was about to be executed. A few days before the execution, Something happened to him. He was lying on his cell in the prison and look, looking up at the skylight. And he saw a, a piece of sky. And suddenly he became aware that the sky is a wonder. And he really got in touch with the sky. For the first time, first time, he told himself that this is the first time in his life he see the sky like that. He's uh, about 30 years old. It's impossible that he had never seen the sky. But this is the first time he really saw the sky.
because there is a moment of awareness happening to him that is mindfulness. And back in Camus, we did not use the word uh, la pleine conscience or mindfulness. And that, hap- that happened to many of us also. There are so many, of, many wonders of life available in our daily life, and yet we have not seen them. We live like in a dream. The beautiful sunrise, the beautiful sunset, the stars, the moon, the flower blooming on by uh, um, on, on your way. All these are wonders of life. All these are messengers of God calling us to come back to true life and to, to be truly alive. But we have lived in such a way that uh, we, we miss most of, of these wonders of life, including the blue sky. And then it was announced that a, a priest is coming to help him to die, to uh, peacefully to perform uh, some rituals so that he can he can benefit from from uh, from the spirituality, but he refused because he, he only had a few hours left before execution, and he thought that the priest could not help him. Now he has only a few hours in order to live, and he wants to maintain that kind of uh, awareness until the last moment, and that is why he refused uh, the visit of the priest. He described uh, the priest as living as uh, a dead person, because in him there is no awareness. In Vikram and Ma, he lives like a dead person. Last Sunday, Easter Sunday, we were in a retreat in Tottenham, and we spoke about the resurrection. Many of us uh, have a body, many many of us are still alive, but we are not aware that we don't treasure, there is no mindfulness. We are not truly alive. And uh, we need only to look around us to see people. Everyone is uh, losing themselves in the worries, the fear, uncertainty, the despair. No one is capable of being in the here and the now. Not many in order to, to to get in touch with the kingdom of God that is in the here and the now. And everyone needs resurrection. It is the Holy Spirit that can make you alive again. And to me, mindfulness and concentration are equivalent to the Holy Spirit. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, you are alive. And the healing, the transformation can can take place. The same thing is true with uh, mindfulness and concentration. When you breathe in, or you make a step in mindfulness, you become alive again. And the kingdom of God is yours. And resurrection happened. And that is uh, le moment de conscience, the moment of awareness. 
and breathing in mindfully and making a step mindfully, there's an act of res- resurrection. And you can feel God, uh, Jesus Christ, present in every moment of our daily life. Buddha means the one who is awake, the one who is mindful. The Buddha is a human being. He never claimed that he is a god. He has suffered like all of us. He has found the path of mindfulness and transmit the practice to us so that we can suffer less and begin to enjoy the wonders of life. And when I studied the gospel, I found that Jesus Christ is a teacher of mindfulness also. And it is possible to allow the Holy Spirit to inhabit you so that you you can be alive at every moment of your daily life. And this is not just talking. This is the practice. When you brush your teeth, it is possible to brush your teeth in such a way that the Holy Spirit is there, mindfulness is there, so that joy, freedom, and happiness could be there during the time you brush your teeth. When, when you go to the restroom, you can do the same. The time in the restroom can be very alive, can be joy, joyful also. And we all can learn the art of mindful living so that we can live deeply every moment that is given us to live on, on earth. And, we don't, and when we are in touch with the kingdom of God, with the wonders of life, when we are capable of generating a feeling of joy, of happiness, at every moment with the practice of mindfulness, we don't think anymore that money fame, power, and sex are con- true conditions of happiness anymore. That is why we have to, to, to learn to release our idea of happiness. And in the Gospel, there are plenty of teaching that can help us to do so. What is true happiness without understanding and true love? Happiness is not possible. And we have to rediscover Jesus as a teacher, not only as a God, but as a teacher. We have to recognize our life. We have to learn to look in a different way. We suffer because of our way of looking. Our way of looking brings fear, anger, frustration, despair. If we can be mindful and concentrated, and if we look at things in order to, to understand, especially to understand the suffering, and then we will be able to remove our fear, anger, and frustration. When I gave that talk in Berkeley, uh, in, uh, in Berkeley, a few days after September 11th, 5,000 people attended. And what we did in the beginning of the talk is to practice uh, mindful breathing, to calm the emotion of fear and anger. America was, was uh, taken by fear and anger at, the, at that time. It's very dangerous. And advise uh, people to practice uh, mindful breathing, mindful walking to calm themselves down. If you are, I said, if you are not calm enough, if you are carried away by your emotion, fear, and anger, 
you do destructive things for yourself and your nation. That's what uh, I reminded people. I said that uh, looking, recognizing the suffering, and ask the question as how that suffering has happened is very important. How the September 11 event happened, we have to look for the reasons. And uh, after that, we have to make use of the practice of uh, deep listening and loving speech. After you have got the calm, you see that the terrorists who have attacked the Twin Towers, they must be very angry. They must suffer greatly in order to, to do something like that. They must have a lot of anger and despair and violence in them. And when they you, you, you begin to see that, you know what to do and what not to do. You might like to turn to them and say, Dear friends, we do, not want, we do not know why you have done such a thing to us. Have we done anything that makes you suffer to the point that you, have, you, should, uh, you, you must do it to us? Have, you said, have we said anything? Have you done anything to you? Have, you, have we tried to destroy you as uh, a religion or as a civilization or as a culture? Please tell us, we don't understand. If, uh, please tell us, if we have uh, said something, or uh, done something to give, uh, uh, give, your, give you your, the impression that we want to destroy you as a people, as a culture, as a religion, we are sorry. We do not have that intention. We may have done it uh, with, with, uh, without uh, um, uh, much, uh, with, with much uh, skillfulness, but we do not have that tension. Please tell us about your suffering, your despair, and that will help us in order to be more careful in the future. Please tell us. And that is the practice. Um, Mm, I proposed for America during that uh, crisis. It was uh, not. Uh, it was um, dangerous kind of advice because uh, there's so much fear, there's so much anger. The terrorists, you cannot talk to them, you cannot listen to them. The only way to do is to kill them. And then uh, I went to New York and I gave another talk at the Riverside uh, Church. And so many people came and advised them to do the same, to come down, to breathe, and to use uh, the practice of deep listening in order to to start the communication, to understand why. I remember in that, um, in that retreat in northern Germany, we also asked uh, returns to apply the practice of uh, compassionate listening and loving speech uh, on the fifth day of the practice to reconcile with uh, the other person. And we said that uh, if uh, the other person is not in the retreat, they may, uh, we may use uh, our portable telephone 
to practice. And um, the next day, four gentlemen came to me and reported that uh, last night before midnight, they were able to telephone home to their father and reconcile with them thanks to the practice of deep listening, deep listening and loving speech. They had learned before what to say and the way to say it. Dear friend or dear father or dear mother, I know that you have suffered so much in the last many years. I was not able to help you to suffer less. Instead, I have responded in such a way that make you suffer more. I am sorry. It's not my intention to make you suffer. It's because I did not understand your suffering and your difficulties. I need help. If you would tell me about your suffering and uh, difficulties, I would, uh, I would, I will not repeat the same kind of uh, mistake I made in the past. I need understanding. I need, uh, I need help. If uh, you do not help me, who will help? Please tell me what is in your heart. That is loving speech. And that should be able to open the door of the heart of the other person. And he or she will tell you about his suffering and difficulties. And now you have a chance to practice uh, compassionate listening. The practice is called mindfulness of compassion. It means that uh, during the time you listen to him or to her, just remember one thing. I listen to him with only one purpose, that is to, to allow him a chance to speak out and to suffer less. I listen like a bodhisattva of deep listening. And if we can retain that kind of uh, compassion in our heart, we are safe. We are protected by the energy of compassion because we remember that listening like this, we have only one purpose, help him speak out and suffer less. And that's why even if the other person mm, uh, while speaking show a lot of uh, wrong perceptions or accusation or blames that will not touch off irritation and anger in you because you are protected by the energy of compassion by remembering your purpose of listening. If the other person show that he has, she has so many wrong perceptions, you, you will not inter interrupt him or her. You say that in a few days, you have enough, you have a chance to, in order to, to offer him or her some information so that uh, he or she will correct their perceptions, but not now. Now is compassionate listening. And that is why you can continue to listen with compassion. And one hour of listening like that can be very healing. Especially when you see the suffering, you have seen already the suffering in him or in her. It's very easy for you to use loving speech. And uh, restore communication and reconcile, become very uh, natural. So one of the four gentlemen in Germany, he said that, well, dear Thay, before the retreat, I could not believe that I can talk to my father in that kind of language. I was so angry at him. And yet after five days of practice, the seed of understanding and compassion in me have been watered. And that is why last night, when I called him, hearing his voice, suddenly I found myself capable of talking like that, gently to him. And he opened his eyes, uh, his, uh, his heart, and we reconciled. 
So the miracle of reconciliation always takes place with uh, the practice of deep listening and loving speech. In Plum Village in France, we used to uh, invite groups of uh, Palestinians and Israelis to come and practice with us. It's very difficult in the beginning. But with the practice of calming emotion and feelings, and with the practice of uh, compassionate listening and loving speech, we always succeed in help, uh, helping each other. And we can see each other as, as victims of uh, wrong perceptions and fear. And transformation and healing always take place. And both groups always come as one group and re report to all of us about the progress of their practice. Dear friends, there will be uh, 10 minutes for questions left. If you have any uh, question or remarks on this practice of mindfulness, uh, there will be a retreat taking place tomorrow. If you want to continue the practice, please join us. There is a microphone here. If you'd like to ask a question, you could raise your hand. Okay, would you like to walk down the steps? <laughs> Is anyone closer ready to ask a question? My question is, uh, is uh, the, there's um, a man who lives nearby, he's uh, an in-law of mine, and when I talk to him, and uh, 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 when he's talking to me, he, and I'm listening, I, um, he might be moaning a lot of the time, and complaining about the weather or the economy, and my understanding was that it's maybe not good to allow somebody to continue on in a, a, you know after hearing him once that I should not be allowing him to continue on and on and on about the economy or whatever it is. And I'd like to know your comments on that. I think the first thing is uh, the first thing before we can help uh, a person, we have to help ourselves first. We, sh we need some practice in order to restore our freshness, our peace, our patience. If there is love and compassion in us, Uh, we are protected from despair. Our, our, uh, our presence, once it has become uh, pleasant, fresh, 
peaceful. The other person will notice right away because every one of us needs such a presence, freshness, peace, compassion, loving kindness. And with that element within you, you will succeed much more easily. Uh, helping a person, of course, uh, is a good thing. But we should not be too eager to do it right away before, uh, before we, we, can, uh, we can prepare ourselves. So uh, maybe a few days of practice in order to recover ourselves and to, uh, um, to restore ourselves, uh, to restore these uh, elements of freshness and uh, loving kindness and compassion and peace in us uh, would be a requirement for success. So if you'd like to ask a question, please stand up and come forward so you can hold the mic. Well, just to say it's a great honor to be here, and what you're saying is revolutionary. It may sound simple, but it's so profound. Um, but we live in a world that's not very compassionate. We slaughter animals, we hurt each other. We don't live in a compassionate country or a world. Would you say something to us about interconnectedness, how we are connected to each other, and the implication of that for us? I have said that um, that uh, without compassion, without love, loving kindness, it will be very difficult to to make connection. Uh, what in what we need really is the energy of uh, understanding and compassion in us. And if we have uh, that, we ourselves have suffered much less already. And anything we do on that base will, will have a success, but not before. And uh, there is another thing. We can do that as an individual, or we can do that as uh, a community, a group of people. When uh, you and members of your family are together, or the member of your community are together, there is a harmony, there is a peace, there is a brotherhood, sisterhood, there is a compassion. And then any attempt to uh, connect and to help the other group or the other person will be much easier. First of all, thank you for opening up my eyes and ears a bit this evening. But I just want to say that uh, sometimes in real situations with people I know and uh, misunderstandings uh, and lack of reconciliation, it's sometimes difficult to find the right words and sometimes the words that are chosen aren't right and you go away from the situation feeling that the reconciliation hasn't happened and is it worth trying again or how to try again and that's really yeah It is always uh, true that uh, if you want to understand the suffering of another person, 
You have to understand your own suffering first. If you want to change the other person, you have to change yourself first. And that is why um, uh, listen to our own suffering, understand our own suffering, allowing the energy of compassion to arise from that is uh, the, f- the first thing we should do. And after that, I'm sure that uh, the action we take will bear fruit. We have um, we have um, a lot of goodwill. We always want to help and to change. But we have to remember that the change should take, in, take place in ourselves first. It's like um, when, we, uh, when we offer a retreat of mindfulness. Uh, we know that our community um, should be uh, solid should have harmony, should have enough brotherhood, sisterhood, should be able to, uh, um, to operate um, in such a way that can bring happiness and, uh, and, and joy to us. And then uh, organizing an event like this one, uh, organizing a retreat would have a meaning and we will succeed. But before we are a happy group, a peace group, a peaceful group, uh, before we have uh, the happiness and the joy of being together, we cannot, we cannot do that. That is, all, that is always true. We have to begin with ourselves. Whether that is peace or, uh, or social justice, <coughs> Um, it was a question about parenting, and you talked about breakfast, and uh, I've got four or five children at home most of the time, and uh, sometimes it just gets to the point where I can't be mindful, and I completely lose my temper and shout at them, and uh, then they go off, and I feel terrible all day, and um, it's a recurring thing that I try to be mindful and practice. Um, and I think it's probably a generational thing, maybe from the past. But I wonder how to uh, advise, advice to be able to catch myself in time. Ten days ago, we had a retreat for educators in uh, London. And uh, I proposed that uh, teachers would have uh, a chance to sit down and talk to, uh, to, to students. Because uh, in the present situation, uh, teachers, they, they have their own suffering. And the students, although they are still young, they have their own suffering and difficulties. And the learning and teaching would not um, be easy if uh, we, we, uh, we ignore all the suffering in each other. And students can make a teacher suffer, and teacher can make a student suffer. So there must be time when the teacher sit down and tell the children about their own suffering and difficulties. And students, they would sit down with the teacher and tell of their suffering in their family and so on. And when there is communication like that, there will be mutual understanding and the relationship between teachers and students will be much better 
and they do, will do the work of teaching and learning much more easily. The same thing is true in the family, between mother and children, father and children. We are so busy, and when we have time, we have some time, we spend it for, telev for television and other things. We have to arrange so that we have moments of, uh, quiet moments to sit down, listen to the bell and breathe, and tell each other about difficulties and suffering. It's very important. The father has to do it, the mother has to do it, and children have to do it. Listening to each other is the practice. And listening like that helps us to understand each other's suffering. And we will stop uh, making uh, each other suffer more. She said, can you offer a song? Yes, uh, the Buddha said, uh, Châu bao chất đầy thế giới Tôi đem tặng bàn sáng nay Một vọc kim cương sáng chói Lòng lành suốt cả đêm ngày The cosmos is full of treasure I would like to offer to you a lot of treasure would like to offer to you a handful of diamonds. Your heart functioning well is a diamond. Your two eyes are also diamonds. Your ear functioning well are also diamonds. And many wonders of life. Je souris à l'étoile qui au ciel encore lui, au soleil qui lentement Nous sort de la nuit à ce jour qui commence, à l'oiseau qui m'enchante. Je souris au monde et le monde me sourit. Je souris à l'enfant qui vient sur mon chemin. Je pense aussi à tous ceux qui ont faim. Ceux qui loin dans ce monde vivent dans la misère, qui ont connu la guerre, qui ont perdu leur mère. I smile to the star that still shine in the sky, to the sun that slowly guides us out of the night, to the day that begins. To the enchanting bird, I smile to the world, and the world smiles to me. I smile to the child that crosses my way. I remember also on those who are hungry, those who live in misery all over the planet. Who have to face the world, who lost their mother. If sometimes my smile is moistened by tears, when I see the great pain that spreads over the world, I shall still be smiling with tears in my eyes. Smiling to life, smiling to death. And one day will come when it is bitterly cold, when even my footstep will not leave any mark. The never ending current of life's energy will carry me along. And I will not look back. The fear will no longer block my way. My heart finally opens very wide. 
then I will become the smile of the earth, of the flower, of the rain, of the sun, and the wind. And one day, perhaps, in a very small child, I will open my eyes to the wonders of life and the little more loving and the little more smiling. I will continue this wonderful way. And one day, perhaps, when it is bitterly cold, when even my footstep will not leave any mark, the never-ending current of life's energy will carry me along, and I will not look back. The fear will no longer block my way. My heart finally opens very wide. Then I will become the smile of the earth, of the flower, of the rain, of the sun and the wind. And one day, perhaps, in a very small child, I will open my eyes to the wonders of life and the little more loving and the little more smiling. I will continue this wonderful way. Dear friends, our teacher this year have 86 years old and he wrote more than 100 books. And all these books are not uh, philosophy, it's uh, not uh, intellectual, but it's from the daily practice of many of you. He reports the stories here, the story there, how people can transform, can make peace to their beloved one. And that is why I think that any CD, any little book, anything can help maybe save the life of one of your friends, one of your beloved one. I remember that there is a one practitioner who came to Plum Village. He said that he moved to a new apartment and the renter of that apartment forgot a CD. And instead of throwing away, then he put on his car and when he drive and he listened Oh, it wake him up and he finally can reconcile with his beloved one. And that is save his life and save a lot of his happiness. And that is the reason why he came to Plum Village. And Thai, our teacher also spent his time to write calligraphy. It means one short sentence of what he recommend you to practice like um, breathe, you are alive, uh, peace start with your wonderful smile, or uh, I am here for you, and many little things like that. And he intend to accompany you to your home and, and to be with you for you to practice. Because he said that this life needs a lot of practice and you can practice without being Buddhist. You only practice mindfulness. And uh, because it's um, it's um, artwork and handwriting by our teacher and his signature is here, so a little bit expensive, but you will see that because one like that one calligraphy can help hungry children of um, I think that that is two class of twenty five children. It means fifty children can be fit for a month of uh, of practice. And also in Vietnam, we have um, about 70 brothers and 60 sisters 
who practice and we went to the countryside and help children to practice to breathe in and breathe out flower fresh and when two boys are fighting each other and another boy said that breathing in breathing out but in Vietnamese <laughs> and then they said oh sorry and they stop and they breathe and they stop fighting each other and our sister they live like that in a very poor area it means uh, I heard they just sent a letter to me saying that sister our kitchen every time is rain is flood and our feet are that tight in order to cook uh, food for 60 person but some day day of mindfulness they can cook for 200 person or 300 person and they need 10,000 euro only. So if you buy a number of these uh, calligraphy, it can help them to have their kitchen properly. Thank you. <laughs>